Hello everybody and welcome! It's the Battle of the Billionaires! It's a new space race! Rich spacemen gone wild! You've read the headlines. I'll spare you the theatrics because in this video we're going to take a look at a new dawn of commercial crewed spaceflight, why many of the headlines are wrong and why two billionaires fulfilling their childhood dreams matters for space going forward. First off, no. While it was fun to watch him floating in the cabin of Spaceship 2, Sir Richard Branson was not the first billionaire to fly to space. The title belongs to Dennis Tito, who flew to the ISS in 2001 as the first space tourist in history. But Tito was not the first commercial astronaut. That honor goes to Toyohiro Akiyama, a Japanese journalist who spaceflight in 1990 to the then still Soviet space station Mir was financed by the Tokyo Broadcast System Corporation. <laughs> what an irony of history that the communist Soviet Union was the first country to enable a commercially funded spaceflight. However, Tito was the first person to pay for the flight with his own money, reportedly 20 million US dollars. He was followed by Mark Shuttleworth in 2002, Gregory Olson in 2005, Anush Ansari in 2006, who later financed the Ansari X Prize, which enabled the development of what is now Virgin Galactic's Spaceship 2. Ansari was followed by Charles Simonyi twice in 2007 and 2009, Richard Garriott in 2008, and Guy La Liberté in 2020. So, no, Branson was not the first rich person to fly to space. And he didn't even stay there as long as the others. He did not even reach a stable orbit. What Branson did achieve first, however, was doing it in his own spacecraft. Yes, the 70-year-old billionaire did a suborbital hop in Virgin Galactic's spaceship 2, christened Unity, this past Sunday, which ushered in the start of commercial space travel for a broader audience. Well, we'll get to the broader part in a bit. First, let's talk about the person media has stylized as Branson's rival. In just a few days after the release of this video, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos will also climb aboard a spacecraft he financed with his billionaire fortune, Blue Origin's New Shepard. Like Virgin Galactic's Spaceship 2, New Shepard is designed to perform a suborbital hop, enable its passengers to take some cool pictures of Earth from above, enjoy weightlessness for a few minutes and then hopefully land them safely down on Earth. While the result for the passengers is very similar, the two vehicles flying potential customers to space are very different. Let's start with Virgin Galactic. Basically, it is a small space plane being flown into the upper atmosphere by a carrier jet, where it is released and continues into space on its single rocket engine. Passengers can leave their seats for a few minutes to enjoy weightlessness and a spectacular view until it is time to strap back in for the return. During this, the wings tilt up, which helps with re-entry, until the vehicle has descended far enough to use the wings again to glide to a controlled landing on the runway. As you can see here, this concept was easily replicated in Kerbal Space Program and I was able to perform a suborbital hop and save landing with little effort. Let's talk about New Shepard. The vehicle produced by Blue Origin looks more like a traditional spacecraft with a booster and capsule design. It goes straight up on its single rocket engine and releases the capsule when it has reached a target altitude. Similar to Virgin Galactic, passengers can leave their seats and enjoy weightlessness and the beauty of space for a few minutes before they have to get back down to the ground, this time on parachutes. In my effort to make a somewhat lifelike replica of New Shepard, I kind of ruined its aerodynamics with too many parts. When decoupling the capsule, the booster overtakes it on the way up because it has significantly less drag but it also overtakes it on the way down, so the end result is similar to what happens with the real New Shepard where the booster makes a powered landing a few minutes before the capsule touches down. 
In essence though, both vehicles offer a few minutes of suborbital flight with some weightlessness and a spectacular view of Earth. At a price, of course. And I'll get to that. First, let's talk about the suborbital part. People have been belittling both private space ventures because they cannot achieve a stable orbit around Earth. But if we're being realistic, it is easier to do a suborbital hop than a real orbital flight. A lot easier. There are efforts on the way for commercial orbital spaceflight though. However, the options are limited because space is hard. Really hard. I think people underestimate the effort required here. But SpaceX has proven with its Crew Dragon that commercial orbital launch and space travel is possible. And the first fully private mission is already planned. Inspiration 4 will take four citizens to low Earth orbit in a Crew Dragon capsule probably in September 2021. Another private flight aboard Crew Dragon is expected to launch one astronaut and three space tourists to the ISS in January 2022, organized by Axiom Space. Further private flights aboard Crew Dragon have been rumored, including one with Tom Cruise for a movie project aboard the ISS. Also, Japanese billionaire Yusaku Maezawa will fly to the ISS aboard a Soyuz spacecraft in December. If that name sounds familiar, it is because he also bought all the seats on the first crewed Starship mission around the Moon, a project that is known as Dear Moon. So there are currently two launch providers that offer private flights to orbit. This number will increase by one when Boeing is finally able to fly their CST-100 Starliner vehicle, enabling another commercial provider to fly space tourists. But all orbital offerings at the moment are ridiculously expensive for regular people. We are talking tens of millions of dollars here. And having just three launch providers is probably not enough to create so much competition that prices will come down into the affordable range anytime soon. Of course, we all expect that SpaceX's Starship will shake up that market a lot due to its reported lower launch costs, but the vehicle is still in early development. Here we return to Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. While the first seat on New Shepard was auctioned off at a whopping $28 million, regular prices are expected to be in the range of half a million dollars. A seat on Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 is the most affordable in comparison at $250,000. Here we finally arrive at the broader audience part I mentioned in the beginning. That broader audience that Branson and Bezos are aiming for is still not really mass market if we're being honest. Yes, compared to the 20 million dollars that Dennis Tito had to pay in 2001, a quarter of a million dollars seems like a bargain. It is still the equivalent of buying a house for most people. In return, you get a few minutes of excitement, so if we're being cynical, it's just a joyride for millionaires at the moment. Which means the target audience is roughly 3% of the world's population, which, granted, is a significant increase compared to the tiny fraction of a percent of billionaires in the world who would be able to afford a seat on a Soyuz or Crew Dragon, or are theoretically able to finance an endeavor similar to Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. Ever since this topic came up, there are people saying that prices will come down like they did for airplane tickets. To that I have two counter arguments. First, air travel serves a practical purpose. It exists to get passengers to their destination quicker than with other modes of transportation. Currently there is no other purpose flying to space than to have that specific experience. We don't have relatives to visit or workplaces to go to outside of Earth. Astronauts on the ISS excluded, of course. Second, let's talk price. The first airline ticket was sold for 400 US dollars in 1914 for a 20 minute flight. Now, while the time is comparable to what you experience with Virgin Galactic or Blue Origin, the price is not. $400 from that time period equals about $10,900 in today's money. 
still a lot more expensive than what a seat on an airplane costs nowadays, but in no way comparable to the price of space travel, even if you take other factors like cost of living and average wage into account. I don't want to get too much into economics, you're here for the space stuff, I would assume. So no, I don't believe that space travel prices will come down rapidly in the next years. Going to space will unfortunately remain the playground for the ultra-rich for quite a while. Unless… well, I guess I do have to talk about economics. About the cis-lunar econosphere, to be precise. That is a term not made up by me, it is something that United Launch Alliance CEO Tori Bruno has talked about extensively. I'll link a presentation he did in the description for you to catch up on. Basically, he argues that an investment of $20 billion into mining, transportation and manufacturing in space could result in a return of $3 trillion over the course of the next 20 to 30 years. Examples for a cislunar econosphere include strategic fuel depots for missions into deep space as well as creating materials that can only be produced in microgravity. A profitable industry in space would require frequent space travel, which would increase the potential for new launch providers to have a sustainable business model, which increases competition, which in combination with economies of scale would exponentially reduce the cost. In essence, it would require the political will to finance new ventures into space. Why political? As I mentioned, the cost of getting up there is so high that it is more likely for government-funded projects to be able to do that. Amazon may be one of the most successful companies in history, but who built the roads their delivery vehicles drive on? Government projects funded by tax money which Amazon coincidentally tries to evade paying. The road to space also has to be paved by governments at the moment. Even the commercial crew program that led to Crew Dragon and Starliner was mainly financed by NASA, a US government agency. But once that initial spark has been lit, it has the potential to set off a chain reaction of space-based economic ventures. A new frontier, if you will. If politicians worldwide have the guts to open up this frontier, we could see affordable orbital flight in our lifetimes. I have to admit, there is some personal bias woven into that last sentence, because I really want it to happen. I told you in a previous video, or multiple, that going to space is my dream. I would be willing to give up a lot to fly to space money, an organ or two, maybe sell one of my children, he said jokingly. I would give up a lot, but I would not want to blow away my life savings on just a few minutes of suborbital flight. A few days in orbit though, that would be a different story. A trip around the moon or even to its surface, yeah, I could see myself getting a loan for that. But what's your take on this? How much would you be willing to spend on a trip to space, be it suborbital or orbital? Do you think you will fly to space one day? Do you even want to? Tell me your thoughts in the comments down below, I'm really interested in that. For me, I see only one chance at the moment to fly to space. <laughs> Get accepted as an astronaut by ESA, for which I applied a few weeks ago. Chances are of course minuscule, but I'll have another whole video about that and the application process. Please subscribe and ring the bell if you're interested in that story. Until then, we can keep on dreaming of space together. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel for more and follow me on my social thingies. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.